In a short period of time, Paul Moorhead went from making furniture in his backyard to now generating more than $60,000 in monthly revenue at his Angel City Woodshop. You need to start small. Invest in things that make you money that aren't just expenses. Boom, that's another five grand. There's probably five or six tools. Like once you have those, you can do 80% of what you want to do. Oh wow. I worked you were committed. maybe 100 hour weeks. How did he build his custom thriving woodshop business? Keep watching to find out in this video. Big thanks to Taylor Brands for sponsoring this video. Well, Paul, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Tell our audience about the location, your shop, kind of when you acquired it, the square footage, just so we know where we are, what we're doing. Sure. We're on South Broadway, uh, just south of downtown in LA. We just LA, actually baby. moved here, upgraded from our old space, and this is about 6,500 square feet or so. Not bad. And, uh, yeah, it's a great space. It's crazy because you went, you know, not too long ago making furniture in the backyard to now having your own shop and really a true business generating, you know, 60K plus. So I'm excited. Our viewers are. Give us a sneak peek and let's just dive into an interview. So sounds good. Let's pop this door open. Wow. You know, this is our third shoot with a woodworking shop and I always yeah. enjoy it because it's such a unique craft. Tell us when you started the Angel City Wood Shop and what's the story behind it, why? Well, I opened the shop in 2016. In my early 20s, I had flipped a house in Portland and that didn't really know what I was doing and just was like, how hard can it be? And my dad's a contractor, so I was like, I'll call him and ask some questions when I need help and he would help me too. And that's kind of when I learned carpentry and generally how to do stuff mm -hmm. and moved to LA actually to pursue acting. But through the oh, years, wow. really rediscovered like this is, I really need to be a builder and creator. So I decided to start building furniture at 33 and just started in my backyard and kept doing it and kept doing it and then uh, about a year and a half two years later I had a shop that's amazing how much did it cost for you to get started here break it down for us was it 20 grand to get in and get the key and start working or to move in here it was I think well over well over a hundred thousand dollars what there was almost no lighting so we spent about thirty five thousand dollars just on the electrical alone two months deposit so that was about 20 grand. Mm -hmm. We also bought these two machines, which are, this was $115,000, that one's 55,000. And so we financed them, but had to make sizable deposits. Mm -hmm. And I knew it'd be tough, but there's, you know, for anyone else out there who's thinking about doing something like this, there were a lot of expenses that just creep up. You're like, I didn't even think about that. Boom, another five grand's out the door. Even with our CNC machine, it's like, oh, we need a really nice air compressor for this. Boom, that's another five grand. It's always like, Calculate your costs and then triple that. That's probably what you're really looking at. Did you have the 100 grand or did you finance th that or I'd already accumulated over time from previous? We were actually f really fortunate to have an investor come into our hey. company this last okay. year. Just because I'm thinking about an audience if they're thinking sure. to get started somewhere, right? So, A, they can either find an investor like you did, they can go to the bank or, mm -hmm. or what? Start with really a small Really what I'd job. recommend is you, you need to start small and keep your expenses as low as possible. Right. At the beginning, you want to invest in yourself. You want freedom. You have to have margin in your life and in your own time to, to be creative, to learn, and not always just be under pressure constantly to pay your bills. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Uh, I would say don't hire anyone until you have to. Keep your expenses low. Be in a space where you have the essential tools, master them, and only buy new things when you absolutely need them. But just don't be, unless you be need smart. It. Yeah. And there, you know, there are a lot of great tools that are 20 bucks, 50 bucks. But if you're thinking about buying that next $5,000 tool, you know, maybe you need it, buy it. But if you don't, like invest in things that make you money that aren't just expenses. Don't, don't throw five grand at something you're gonna use twice a month. If you can sub it out and have someone else who has that tool do that mm -hmm. for you twice a month. Right. What's the number one factor to your success at this point from getting started at the shop and now you're generating over, this, over 60? Well, I would say two things come to mind. No matter what industry you look into, people who've succeeded will tell you there, there aren't really these secrets right. or shortcuts. You just have to do the work and put in the time. So number one, I think just having worked very hard to learn my craft and to fulfill orders and to become an expert at what I do. And secondly, I think, you know, in my specific industry, to me, this is my, my business and my job, but it is an art to me. So I, I love the beauty that we can bring to people's lives through what we do, and I, I actually care about that. Mm -hmm. So the, actually the passion for the craft itself is what drives me. So I think those two things in combination have, you know, are really important. If I could go back and do things differently, there'd probably be things I cha would change, but I think my strategy was I need to 
be a master of this first before I can teach others. Mm -hmm. And when I say master, I'm not a master, but you know, I'm proficient. I'm confident in the quality and the techniques that I employ. So once I got to that point where I felt like I've got a really good handle on this, then I started bringing in others that, so I could really train them. How many people you have working with you? Uh, three. three so guys. we're still, yeah, we're still not a huge shop. Yeah, yeah. but still, you've scaled yeah. it past 60,000 yeah. with yeah. the amount yeah. of employees and yeah. people that you have. That's pretty incredible. You guys keep watching to hear more tips, hacks from Paul. It's gonna be incredible. Aside from woodcraft skills itself, Paul, what other skills do you think I would need to have to succeed as a woodshop business owner, et cetera? It's hard to narrow it down. I'll do I my know, best. There's be so, there are so many things you need to do, but starting with the basics, assuming you have a team, is understanding how to utilize your team, understanding the strengths and weaknesses that you have, that your team has. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of the complicated nature of any industry, but in woodworking especially, is there's, there's a thousand things that you need to master or you know you're trying to understand. But again, like 80% of them is like four things. Are we working efficiently? We're working well together. Are we motivated? And are we, actually, are we getting the results we're hoping for? Okay, well, That's what it. needs to change? You know, sanding is taking forever. Do you have the right sander? Maybe you're used to you doing something one way and you've been doing it so long, you never stop to ask, is there another way I could be doing this? Mm -hmm. A lot of your intuitions are correct. Sometimes they're not, but if you're doing something and it's taking too long, you just feel like this is taking right. too long. Doesn't feel right. Don't just keep going. Take a minute and say, what else is there? Is there a tool I've never heard of? Is there a technique I haven't heard of? I'd rather spend 10 minutes reevaluating than just waste three extra hours on a task. So there's always something like that in almost every area of the business. Let's talk about some of the uh, low points that you've experienced as a business owner post opening your business, right? Is it yeah. acquiring new customers that was challenging and maybe you're going through something now? What would your advice be to other viewers experiencing the same things on how to encourage them to keep going? Probably my lowest points had to do with lack of sleep and too much work, mm -hmm. frankly. When I, when I first started, I do vaguely remember kind of some months was like, I really need to bring in some, some more clients. But luckily, you know, I had a shop on a busy street People instantly thought, you're here, you're an expert, you know what you're doing. You know, I, I had a lot of work really quick, but I actually ended up living in my shop for two years. Oh, wow. I worked for the first two to three years of the business. I probably took four or five days off total. That's insane. And just worked every day. You were committed. Maybe 100 hour weeks. You know, I came in without a lot of savings. It was just, you know, five grand a month in rent. So I, I realized I need to make about $20,000 a month. To, Did you break even? With, with no employees, just me to just pay the bills. And the reality of like, I need to make 20 grand a month. I'm kind of new at this. I need to pour everything I have into the business right now. It's been the biggest learning experience of my life. I learned that I could be a people pleaser. It's especially when you're new, you're trying to prove yourself. Maybe you take some deals that like, this isn't great, but I'm trying to grow my portfolio. So you say yes a lot. And there, there is value to that. But I, I, I learned, for example, one thing that's always stuck with me is some, some deals I would do and you feel great about it. You get off the phone or say, yes, it's a deal. You're and you're excited like, you're about like it. stoked. Yeah. Other deals, you know, a client would be like, yeah, I, I love your work and I'd love for you to make this piece, but you know, my budget's here, you know, can, will you do that for me? And so I, I remember that feeling of hanging up the phone and just not feeling good, feeling mm -hmm. defeated. I think, I think I've just been taken advantage of or I acquiesced and did something that was good for you, bad for me. Mm -hmm. That's just something you really need to pay attention to is how, how am I feeling and how are these things panning out for me? Uh, well, I'm excited because we're, I'm gonna ask you a lot more questions about the approach to customers and how to yeah. charge the right price, right? Yeah. How to not underprice and so on. So we'll dive into that later on. Yeah. So you've built your business with very little marketing. How do customers find out about you? Find out about us through either referrals, Instagram, or even just literally Googling custom furniture maker, Los Angeles. We're, we're, we're gonna be one of the there. top people that come up. Really? So do you invest into Google? We don't. Interesting. <laughs> and yet you're gonna be yeah. at the top. Yeah, we're, we're first page on Google for it. Like, depending on what you search for, we are often your number one hit on the front page of Google. People leave not, reviews? Not, not or... always, but yeah, we have reviews, we're on Yelp, we just have enough of a presence, you know, and it's funny, like, I have a lot of uh, room to grow, actually, in that area. I, I would like to do more marketing. I'd like to get mm -hmm. into the, my website and just, like, make sure it's 100% effective. Yeah. But it's, it's all good. Everything we've done is good. Online. But can be done better is what you're saying. But we're honestly already overwhelmed with work. So we have about a six month lead time right oh, now wow. for projects. We typically have you. 15 to 18 clients who've already given us deposits. So if I got to a point where we're like, we really need to bring in business, I would probably focus on it more, but we're like, we're, we're doing okay with that. But as of that. today, you don't have a designated person for Google, for Yelp, for Instagram. It's no. just kind of on the fly. 
yeah. we're busy enough six months out, yeah. we can't handle anything more. I mean, it's yeah. a good spot to yeah. be in. When you started this official shop or your business, right? What was the difficult part of getting going? Anything that comes to mind? Like, how did you get through that difficult point? When you start something like this, like you need a lot of tools. So when you're starting out, unless you have deep pockets, at the beginning, every job, I was buying the tool to finish that job. Oh, wow. Okay. But eventually you have more and more tools and all of a sudden you have everything you need. The biggest first challenge was actually having a shop. Being in your garage or backyard is fine for a while, but only goes Think a long about way. your neighbors, and it's 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 not a great long-term setup. So the financial burden's there, right? Yeah. The tools, but it's amazing that you basically do a job that then pay for the tools that will allow you to do the next job. Is that sort of snowball effect? One way to do it versus going yeah. to the bank? But you know, there's probably five or six tools. Like once you have those, you can do 80% of what you want to do. Okay. But then the other 20% of tools, there's about 10,000 of those that you want. <laughs> so slowly you just accumulate what you need. And you know, there's periods where you know, you're good for a year. Like you don't really need any new major tools. So just getting started is the biggest hurdle. And then obviously if you're good with your finances or you know, you're successful with bringing in revenue, mm -hmm. it's not as painful to take that next little step and you can build on what you already know. Okay, yeah. well I can't wait to find out what the five tools are that you said if you have them, you could do 80% of the job. I made that number up, but I, I can probably right around make there. it work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, no, I don't have a logo. No, I, I don't have a website. No, I, I don't have an LLC set up. Hello? Hello? You need an LLC to separate your personal assets from your business assets. You'll then be able to open up a bank account, enjoy tax benefits, and overall look more professional. I just did it hassle-free with Taylor Brands. Starting your business in the right way can be incredibly easy and fast. Easy as registering your domain, getting your trademark done, creating your own logo, having a business email and a website, and getting all legal documents and permits while educating yourself on what each one means and why you need them. All done in a very short period of time, allowing you to focus back on the creative side. At Upflip, we want you to start your own business and show it in every episode with every single entrepreneur that we cover. More so, we want you to do it without having to go through the hoops and the extreme sacrifices that a lot of them had to go through. That's why we choose partners such as Taylor Brands that find a unique and comfortable angle to solve multiple problems with their one-stop shop that tackles creating your brand, LLC, and identity from the ground up in just a few clicks. Check out Taylor Brands with the link below so that you can start your much needed LLC today. What are some steps that you've taken on day one to bring in more customers? There's what you should do and what I did, which may yeah, not be break the it same. Down for us. But I, you know, I've never really advertised. Almost all my work comes from either return clients or just word of mouth. And over the years, you know, if you do good work, people just start to know who you are. And we work for a lot of design firms and they know each other. So you're getting referrals mm -hmm. a lot. And also, you know, documenting your work. So, you know, things like Instagram have been amazing. I couldn't imagine not having Instagram, just being able to finish a piece, take photos that you love and publish them. Most of the work we do is very high end custom residential furniture. So we've done restaurants and stuff like that. So obviously people see that kind of stuff in public and they just find out who built the pieces. Do you sign every piece with Angel City Workshop? We talk or? about that almost every week, that we don't that have you a- That should? We don't have a brand yet or any- Like we, burn it we, into the furniture, Sometimes you know? when you have like a box that's like, no one will ever see this, we'll like draw on it and sign it and stuff on the insides, but uh, we actually just leave everything pristine. Interesting. I'm probably gonna change that though. You should. I just need yeah. to get it. Start that legacy yeah. of, of yeah. your furniture. Yeah. Imagine yeah. somebody a hundred years ago or in the future, buys this piece of furniture and then there's this beautiful stamp that says, yeah. made by Paul. I'll do it. I think that's pretty just, cool. Just Paul, yeah. yeah. Made by Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you get started at this location. Yeah. When do you feel like you become profitable? After one job, 10 jobs? No, it's definitely not one job. In, in the custom furniture business, you have high seasons and low seasons. It's kind of month by month and project by project. Each project, we hope to be profitable and we, we track that. You know, we've had $100,000 months, $60,000 months. We've also had $10,000 months. Oh, wow. So, so sometimes they, they offset each other and you should expect that. It's not always going to be consistent, but you should be keeping track of, A, know what your seasons are, know when you have a busy season, when you have a slow season, and you want to prepare for that. But in terms of our own profitability, everything we, we profit, we pretty much reinvest back into the business. Especially at this stage in time? Yeah, so we, we have projects where it might be $5,000, we might only make $1,500 profit, mm -hmm. $1,000 profit. Larger projects, you know, they're more profitable, so we really prefer those, but you know, we have $60,000 projects, $80,000. Just one project pro could be 60K? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
In terms of your online presence, what I recall you mentioned you have Instagram and the website. Mm -hmm. Walk us through how you're using those two tools right now to further your business, grow revenue, and continue the brand awareness and reputation, et cetera. Uh, well, Instagram to me is kind of our online business card and portfolio. So I really enjoy you know, posting our latest projects and it keeps people engaged and seeing what we're doing and what we're doing next. And our website you know, really is your true business card online and the place where you want people to end up. Do you engage with customers on those two platforms, website, Instagram? Do you get mm -hmm. business from them? Yeah, we get a fair amount of business because of Instagram, either through you know, the actual tools it has or they say, hey, we, we saw you on Instagram and we love your work. Mm -hmm. But they always end up at your website. You really want, especially if you're in an industry where aesthetics and design are what people are hoping that you're good at, you, your website needs to be beautiful. People are gonna get an immediate impression about you from your website. What is the aesthetic? Do I like their taste? Would I trust them with something I'm gonna spend a lot of money on? So mm. keep it simple, keep it clean, but ideally it's beautiful and it's easy to use. Let's check out this corner. I see you got these bits and pieces, all kinds of things. Yeah. What do you want to highlight here? I mean, there's a lot of things, obviously, little things. Well, What's I know important? this isn't a Festool commercial, but we love our Festool stuff. So these are our probably most important small kind of powered hand tools like jigsaws. And it's a big name in the woodworking industry. So Not you don't Makita find this stuff or... at Home Depot. It's very expensive, but once you use it, you're like, oh, I get it. I love really this. Really can tell the difference. Yeah, I love it. So, you know, we, again, we just moved here. This is not our final mm -hmm. resting place for everything, but we got router bits and everyone calls these spatulas, but they're really yeah, putty you, knives. These are, are putty knives. A lot of our good stuff is in here. So mm -hmm. huge, huge squares and all degree, sorts yeah. of measuring tools. And Man, last time I used this was in high school. <laughs> But like I mentioned earlier, like 80% of your work is done with just 10 tools, you know, mm -hmm. and everything else you just need every now and then. So show you know, us the number cool one stuff, tool. Beautiful chisels. Number one tool. Yeah. Is that even possible for me to ask that question? No. I, not, right? <laughs> I mean, if I, could, if I was only allowed to have one tool, it right. would be a table saw. Okay. Yeah. And that's right there behind yeah, there? Right there. So you can, you can still make some things happen with just that one tool. Absolutely. Well, I want to go check out some of the finished uh, cabinets or furniture that you've designed. Sure. And I remember I saw them in the, in, the, in the showroom that you're still setting up. Yeah. As we're getting there, what kind of systems and tools do you use to prioritize workflow, tasks, jobs, etc.? I remember a specific day when I had all these note cards and I was like, okay, I think I need project management software. Mm -hmm. And I love that stuff. I love systems. So I tried several, but the one I've really been happy with is monday.com. Monday.com. Okay. Yeah. It's not made for woodworking necessarily, but it's very, you can modify it and make it whatever you want it to be. Well, tell us what we're looking at here. This looks pretty cool. This is called a flat file. Mm -hmm. So this is going to go under the client's uh, bed, I believe, and I see. this is meant to store prints and you know delicate pieces of art and stuff like that. So mm. enormous drawers. I love the soft clothes. Soft clothes. What would something like this cost me if I were to show up at the door and say, Paul, I need something this like this made? Probably around three grand. Three yeah. grand. Yeah. And what you would what would your profit margin be on this thing? Uh, probably about twelve hundred on bucks. this one actually. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah. And these are three coffee tables. It's kind of a single coffee table concept, but it's three blocks. They're so not joined. So that's what I was looking no, for. No, they're independent. So this has mitered edges. So it kind of looks like a panel that's been folded. There's, oh, wow. there's, you don't really see a seam there. And it's kind of cool to see them all disappear. Look close at, at the same oh, time and disappear. That's beautiful. Yeah. Look, look at yeah. that. Like, yeah. You'd never tell if no one yeah. ever pointed it out. And what are we looking at cost-wise for all these three pieces? I'm embarrassed to say that I don't always know the right numbers. <laughs> I believe this was 6,800 6, for bucks. these three, yeah. Okay. All right, you guys, blitz time with Paul. Thank you to our viewers for submitting these questions. So Angel Pine would like to hear how you got your first client and how your pricing and pricing strategy has changed over time. First client, I think, was a friend from church. I made a so, Douglas fir table for them that they still have. That's also a big challenge is how do I price my work? I mean, mm -hmm. we can talk about that for an hour. Yeah, let's skip it okay. for okay. the okay. later uh, segments because okay. I think okay. it's not more of a blitz question. But thank you, Angel, for submitting your question. Should so, I answer, actually answer it? We'll save it, so okay. keep watching. Okay. <laughs> Keith is asking, if you were to start from scratch tomorrow, what are the top three tools you'd get first? Major tools would be a table saw, a planer, and a jointer. Sergio's asking you know, about advice that you can give to those who are passionate about woodworking but are afraid to take the lead because they see some woodworkers just struggling financially. Yeah, there is a joke about if you want to get into woodworking, the best advice is don't do it. <laughs> so but it's, it's half a joke. It, it's hard. But if you really love it and you're confident, like, of course you can do it. If mm -hmm. other people have done it, you can do it. Just know it's going to be difficult. 
but prepare for it. Keep your expenses low. And uh, if you're passionate about it, you can do it. Keep at it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sergio. And last question here is uh, Moto Aesthetic is asking, what is the best way to build relationships in business without having to undercharge to get jobs? My philosophy is like, I, I deal with customers on a very just human level. I tell jokes if I'm feeling silly, like I try to create just a really real, honest line of communication, mm -hmm. but it, just literally explain it. This is, this is really difficult work. This is what I'm about to do. This is how long it's going to take. The craftsmanship I'm going to offer you is so far beyond what you're going to buy, you know, find at Target Macy's. or even high-end stores. Your mm -hmm. work's going to be better. And just be really friendly and say, hey, if it's not in your budget, you know, I'm sorry. I'd love to build something for you in the future if things change, but, right. you know, this, this is my price. All right. And just, just be firm. Do yeah. you do commercial and residential? Yeah. You do? Yeah. So what are the pros and cons for one versus the other? The pros of commercial work is typically budget. Like they, they're, it, it's a legitimate business that mm -hmm. knows this is a cost. We want to have a beautiful restaurant. We need to hire a great company and we, we expect to pay for that. But I love residential too. That's mostly what we do. A lot of our work is direct to client, but a lot of it's through design firms as well. So the design firms are also great because again, they understand what pricing is look is going to look like mm -hmm. beforehand right. and it's also if there is a design firm involved there is someone who has a budget to hire a design firm that kind of clientele typically isn't going to be is is price conscious yeah. what can you say that's important for our viewers regarding the uh, design firms like how important is that relationship for you very you know, you might have a great client, but like they're probably only going to buy one dining table. Mm. And maybe next year they might buy a sideboard. But design firms are working with clientele all the time. So developing and maintaining those relationships is really important that they know they can count on you. You can you produce quality work on time. Mm -hmm. Those are those. Are, that's a really strong asset to have as a part of your business. How many do you work with across LA? There are three or four that we work with a lot over over years. You know, mm -hmm. projects almost every month or every few months. But total, probably forty. 40 design firms? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I thought you'd say like, you know, I can count yeah. them on my two hands, but 40, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a good 40 relationships to have yeah. Yeah. and create a recession-proof business in yeah. a way. Yeah. I want to quickly recap all the machines, the major ones that you have here. So let's start with this guy. Uh, briefly tell us what it is, what it costs, and what it does. This is a jet 20-inch helical head planer. So a planer basically is, think of it as a thicknesser. So if you put a bowed piece of wood through this, it will come out still bowed but a consistent thickness. So ideally, you come to the planer after coming from the jointer. Mm -hmm. So the jointer, this plane is slightly below this plane. I see. So the wood travels through this way, and these mm -hmm. helical head cutters, you wouldn't be able to tell, are the same height as this. So whether it's one passes or four passes, however many it takes, you, you slide the wood through this way, and it will give you a dead flat surface. So once you have one flat surface, let's say you are planing a board, then mm -hmm. you can go to the, to the planer, and it will make the top parallel to the surface that's against the, the bed of the planer. What's the cost on this, Paul? Probably, I think about four grand, okay. something like that. I and that one's more? this is about, I think, 6,800 or so, Jeez. something like that. Okay. And you mentioned earlier on that if there's one tool that you can just keep, this would be it. Yeah, you can do so much with a table saw. So yeah, this is a saw stop. It's an amazing tool. When the saw is running, if this, contacts your skin, the blade will immediately drop. That's because I told you I didn't want to run it because I'm scared of it. And then yeah. you said, oh, don't worry, because yeah. you can touch the blade right. and it won't cut my finger. Yeah, they do these hot dog tests like online, you can see, and it just, they'll, they'll demonstrate. They'll have a hot dog and it'll just, and it just drops Insane. right down. So, I'm glad they have those yeah. safety features. So what would this yeah. thing cost? They have different models, but this is about an $8,000 setup. Soft this stuff. is their industrial model. Most power tools have, you know, basically reference planes. So the two main reference planes on a table saw are uh, the main uh, saw <clears throat> table surface here and your fence. So every time you're doing a good cut, you want to make sure you're really nicely registered on the table saw itself and on the fence. So you have two you reference to planes anywhere. to move with. Yeah. What happens in the office usually on a day-to-day -day Paul basis? I mean, you, you're probably in the shop more than the office, am I right? Uh, it varies. There are periods where I'm in here 90% of the day for two, oh, wow. for two weeks. And there are also periods where I'm in the shop 90% of the time. So it really does change. Let's sit down. But I do, I do a lot of 3D modeling and planning and dealing, you know, clients and doing quotes and doing financials. So 
I could literally, I could be in here 100% of the time and be busy. As you mentioned software, 3D, so let's show our audience yeah. kind of what you use and how important is it for a woodworking shop. Is yeah. this where it begins? It is. So I started with SketchUp and I did that for years and I switched to Fusion 360 about five years ago and I love it. I mm -hmm. couldn't imagine my business without it. This is something we kind of called a wave sideboard. If you haven't heard of a sideboard, it's a credenza. So a piece of furniture that goes against the wall, but mm -hmm. the doors are Oh, wow. Curved, the doors, and uh, there's drawers on the bottom, on the interior there, and that is stained cool. black on the interior on na and natural white oak on the outside. And So nothing happens in the shop until it's finalized in the computer. Am I correct? Or Almost nothing. Yeah, if we're making a cutting board or something like that, maybe not. But yeah, we 3D model every single job we do. And I, this is not common, but actually I, I make a 3D model and set of drawings even for every quote I do. So if you come to me and say, hey, I'd like a table, we work on the design process, whether it's already designed or I design it, and I create a, a 3D model, a set of drawings, and a 3D model link that will come with your quote. So you get an email with a link, you can see the table in 3D in your web browser, and it has a, you know, set drawings already created. And it, calls, it comes from Fusion, the link. It comes from Fusion. At which point in time did you hire your first employee, and what was, what was the role for that hire? I think it was about a year or so in. I'd never wanted to work alone forever. And I mean, frankly, when you're building furniture, some things are just quite frankly very large and heavy. So it's very yeah. difficult to do woodworking on your own long term. So at the beginning, it was kind of, kind of felt a bit more like I was the surgeon and he was my helper and just it was kind of like helper. scalpel. And, but over time, you're also throwing, okay, you do it this time, let mm -hmm. me watch you. And then you start to understand what they're really good at. And my first employee was actually my brother, okay. Will, who's awesome. And there were things that he did and got really good at that I thought, you're better at, than me at that now. That's your thing. And so just throwing him in the mix and trying to learn what their, their greatest skills are, what they're good at and really... You know, how many people, to grow. How many people do you have right now, total? Uh, three. Plus you? Three and me, so there's four three. total. Got it, yeah. okay. When it comes to a custom job, right, you have a $60,000 project you mentioned, mm -hmm. and you have a $5,000 project. Are the margins staying the same, and how do you determine costs across such a spectrum of pricing? The margins are, are similar, but we tend to have higher margins on the bigger projects, the bigger we prefer them. They can be overwhelming and they're, they're also harder to accurately predict how much time you'll spend. Sometimes it's hundreds of hours. Oh, wow. So on a $5,000 project, you're not gonna be 40 hours off on your projections, but on a project that takes you a month, you might be 40 hours off and you're gonna face challenges. So you have to build that in at the front knowing I'm mm. going to have problems, but when you when you do something three times versus you're, you're gonna do it 60 times, even the smallest amount of error in your predictions is you know, exasperated over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. There's often a lot more materials involved. You know, again, every project has some unique thing about it that's uniquely challenging. You don't always know what that's gonna be until you face it. So you wanna build enough margin in your projects that that's, you can absorb that. What's a good month? What's a bad month on average? I know in yeah. the beginning we mentioned, you know, yeah. 60,000. Yeah. Is that about the average or? That, that's, that's like a reasonable good month that we have right. often, 60, 70,000. What would be the margins um, on that? Roughly? Probably about 15 to 20%. Okay. You know, and every project is different. You know, you might build something that you could put 50 hours into that's small, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. your material cost might only be $100, but you charge $3,000 for it. I see. But a larger project, oftentimes your material costs are around 25% of the total price. Mm -hmm. But again, you, you can charge whatever you want. But that ends up being kind of a sweet spot for what we do. But a lot of it goes into overhead and paying our team and everything else that's involved in running a business. So if I make 15 to 20% profit on a, on a job, that's, I'm pretty happy with that. What skills or traits do you look for? Like, let's say I walk in your office and say, Paul, I want to work with you. Obviously, this is something that's teachable if I like yeah. it. But besides those aspects, yeah. anything specific you look for? First and foremost, that they love woodworking and that this is something that they're passionate about. I, I would rather hire someone who has one year experience, but they just, they love it mm -hmm. and they're excited about it and they wanna do it long term than someone who has 10 years of experience, but you can kind of tell they're not that into this. This is just a job for them. So first it'd be passion and then obviously skills. You want people that you don't have to babysit all the time. That's a big deal too, is especially if you're building high quality projects. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw anyone in there and say, can you build this $20,000 piece for me? Yeah. So we really work as a team. That is a difficult thing is not micromanaging, but also, you know, making sure that things are going 
the way you want and, mm -hmm. and guys are doing a good job. So you, gotta, you wanna hire people who, who themselves care that their work is very good, that it's personal to them. Mm -hmm. And you can trust that their intent is, to, is excellence. Question I have is like when you have a project and you're deciding on the piece of furniture, yeah. how do you decide on what kind of wood to use? There's so much. Well, oftentimes your your client will know okay. if they're not familiar with wood species. I, I often ask them, you know, just look up photos or sh send me what you have in mind, and I'll know what that is. Got it. But ninety, probably at least ninety percent of our work is in either white oak or walnut, black walnut. So white oak is incredibly dense. It's 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 just an amazing species to work with. It's durable, it's hard, and it's beautiful. And black walnut is similar. It's a little softer than white oak, but it's gorgeous. So if you're looking for a darker wood project, mm -hmm. we gravitate towards walnut. And if you're thinking lighter, we gravitate towards white oak. What do we got here? These are these are black walnut slabs from Morgan, actually. My buddy's an arborist and cut these down himself. So we we so cool. use these periodically, but most of the time, you know, we, we get our material from a lumber, you know, hardwood lumber yard. Teach me the terminology. This, you call this raw edge furniture? And then that stuff is just basic. Yeah, so this live edge, I mean, everyone's probably heard of a live edge table. So yeah. this but, this is obviously, th this was the full width of the tree. Yeah, yeah. And this is just the natural shape the tree has in this slice. So that's called a live edge. And you don't mess with it as far as furniture no, goes. But typically, you know, you yeah, take, you you take the bark off and yep. sand it and make it nice nice to the touch and all mm -hmm. that. But you, you're trying to preserve the natural shape that it had uh, to that. begin with. At this point in time, you have three employees. How do you delegate work? Let's take a project. Mm -hmm. What things do you take on yourself? And what things do you delegate to others and why? We typically have a project lead for each project. Mm -hmm. So we do work as a team, but we typically are working on between one and three projects at once. If it's a very large project, there might be like a week or two period where that's all we're doing. But let's say we have, you know, two tables and a coffee table we're working on. Each project will have a guy like this. This is your project. We know that there's going to be hours at a time where it's like, hey, you know, you, you two guys work together on getting this panel made, but then the other guy will go back to his project. So we work together, but it helps them to have their own deadlines. Even though this is my business and in the end it's my deadline, we might sit down together and say, these are the drawings, this is the plans, I'm here to support. I'm involved, but this is your, your deadline's Friday. We know that's possible. That also helps um, your team members to have their own kind of, you know, sense of responsibility and ownership over each project. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Why do you think a lot of wood shops close up and fail? Give us two, three things that you think is the reason and how one well, can a, avoid. A, it's just very difficult. It's hard work, and I think a lot of shops, they might even close because it's, they just aren't enjoying it anymore, mm. or it's too stressful. But the most practical thing I, I can say is, again, invest your money and time wisely. Like we talked about, time not buying money. the tools you don't need. Mm -hmm. I heard a story about a guy who I think was already pretty wealthy, started a wood shop, and he spent $500,000 on shipping crates to ship his unpurchased furniture that no one had ordered yet. So he's preparing for the future. I'm gonna need these, how am I gonna fulfill orders? But, but he doesn't have a business yet. He put the cart way before the horse yeah. and he went out of business. So just make small, wise decisions as you go. Buy the tool you need, but buy it when you need it. Don't spend your money and time focusing on crazy ideas or wild possibilities about what may or may not happen. Focus on what's practical, makes you money, and is gonna move your business forward. Okay, well, any last words to our viewers uh, in terms of entrepreneurial thoughts, business thoughts, advice, tips, whatever's on your heart and mind? I say in the end, go for it. It's wise to be a planner, but if you have a passion for a business you wanna start, something you wanna pursue, sure, do your research and then just start like taking that step onto the inv invisible bridge, you know, there will be ground for your feet. So move forward, walk forward, and, and take the risk. Go for it. Awesome. Paul, it's yeah. been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good to meet you. Yeah, Likewise. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap, you guys, with Paul, the owner of Angel City Woodshop. I really hope you were inspired, you learned a lot. We would love for you to execute on that so you can grow and succeed in anything you do. So take a second to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you don't miss any of our videos and stay tuned for a lot more fun content. Thank you for watching.